thanks uh, uh, to the organizers. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to address uh, uh, this group and to give some starting remarks for a conference which uh, looks uh, like a learning exercise for all of us. We are going to learn a lot about contemporary developments country by country throughout Europe. Uh, the exact subtopic of my talk is the European Union, from Christian democratic project to secular cosmopolitanism to populist Christian neo-nationalisms. Uh, the relations between religions, nationalisms, and patterns of globalization have historically been and continue to be complex, multiform, and diverse. They can hardly be reduced to simple unilinear, unidirectional, or universal formulations, or to simple alternating dynamics between progressive globalization and regressive, reactive renationalizations. The task of our conference is to understand the emergence of various types of neonationalisms within a transnational European Union in our global age and the various facilitating and hindering roles which various religions are playing in this emergence. As a starting point of our reflections, we may want to recognize that the emerging neonationalisms themselves seem to be subject to global dynamics and appear to be promoted by complex transnational coalitions beyond the European Union. European developments, therefore, need to be understood within a global historical perspective. The transnational project of the European Union was an attempt to partially transcend the Westphalian European system of nation states at the very same moment when the Westphalian system was becoming finally globalized through process of post-colonial nation state formation after World War II, now encompassing the entire world. The 1957 Treaty of Rome, which established the foundation of the European Union, was born as a Christian democratic project, grounded on a dual reconciliation, the reconciliation of France and Germany to nations which had been at war or preparing for war for 75 years, and the reconciliation of Catholics and Protestants in the new post-World War II Christian Democratic parties in Germany and Holland. The broader global context was the new transatlantic axis between Protestant Washington and Catholic Rome, anchoring the Cold War between the liberal, democratic, capitalist, Christian West and the Soviet system of atheist, authoritarian, communist states. The seeds were planted by the initiative of Catholics active in the French resistance, who became leaders of the Christian Democratic MRP, and already before the end of the war, spoke openly of the need for Franco-German reconciliation. The late Catholic grassroots movement, Pax Christi, was born at the same time in France with a similar aim of Franco-German reconciliation. In his 1498, excuse me, 1948 speech at Strasbourg, announcing the coming, sup, coming supranational European community, Robert Schuman, later to become the first president of the European Parliamentary Assembly in 1958, stated, we are carrying out a great experiment, the fulfillment of the same recurrent dream that for 10 centuries has revisited the peoples of Europe, creating between them an organization, putting an end to war, and guaranteeing an eternal peace. Despite this reference to European medieval Christendom, it was clear that the more relevant reference was the need to overcome the history of constant warfare between the states, which was a legacy of the Westphalian system. Schumann added, our century has witnessed the catastrophes resulting in the unending class of nationalities and nationalisms must attempt and succeed in reconciling nations in a supranational association. He ended with the words, this new policy constitutes probably the supreme attempt to save our continent and preserve the world from suicide. 
It is important to remind ourselves of these forgotten spiritual religious sources of the European project if we want to understand the contemporary crisis of what Schumann called the European spirit, which in my view is at the root of the present crisis of the European Union and of the re-emergence of neo-nationalisms. The project of a supranational democratic Europe had a Catholic Christian orientation. By Catholic, I do not mean, I do not mean Roman Catholic, much less a project for a Catholic Europe. Franco's Spain and Salazar's Portugal were clearly excluded from the project. But it's not coincidental that all the signatories of the 1951 Treaty of Paris and of the 1957 Treaties of Rome were Catholic leaders of Christian democratic parties. Nor was just accidental that the first Gaulis and, Nas and other nationalist parties, most socialist parties, and all northern Protestant countries look at the new European community with suspicion. It is not that Catholic nations were more immune to the modern tendency to national self-sacralization <laughs> than other European religious communities. If one considers World War I as the apotheosis of nationalist conflagration, where millions of European youth were sacrificed at the altar of the nation state, then one cannot but observe that Catholics embraced the war with as much euphoria and jingoistic, jingoistic frenzy as did most people, intellectuals, political leaders, and the clergy throughout Europe. We were reminded of this before. While a group of prominent German Catholics described the war as the new springtime of religion, Pope Benedict XV, elected shortly after the outbreak of World War I, more soberly viewed it as, quote, the darkest tragedy of human hatred and human madness, telling the German bishops that he was, quote, supremely bound in conscience to counsel, suggest, inculcate nothing else but peace. Tirelessly, he denounces, denounced the war as a scourge, a horrible and useless slaughter that was turning the world into a hospital in a charnel house and was the suicide of civilized Europe. But the Pope's intervention fell on deaf ears. Both sides viewed them as irritant, siren songs interfering with their sacred national interests and their aims of military victory. He was accused by both sides of aiding the enemy and of trying to sub national resolve. His replies that he was supporting the cause of mankind rather than that of the belligerent parties was not appreciated. Ultimately, like transnational proletarian solidarity, Catholic or human solidarity proved much weaker than national solidarity or blind devotion to the nation state. More significantly, members of transnational religious orders who had been expelled from many countries by liberal anti-clerical legislation precisely because of their presumed transnational Catholic allegiance returned to their countries to fight for their respective national causes. Even the Jesuits, the most transnational and papal of all Catholic orders, proved unable to resist the global force of nationalism and to side with the Pope. Over 850 French Jesuits and over uh, 530 German Jesuits return from the exile to take part in the war as combatants, mostly as combatants, military chaplains or auxiliaries. World War I constituted probably the high point of the fusion of what could be called national secular civil religion and ecclesiastical religion throughout Europe, even for a transnational religion like Catholicism. I am providing these anecdotal historical references to precisely illustrate the complexities of the relations between transnational religion and nationalism. Clearly, the reference to the role of Catholic political leaders in the formation of the supranational European community illustrates the profound transformation in the transnational consciousness of European Catholicism from World War I to the aftermath of World War II. Undoubtedly, this transformation was associated with the reflexive learning triggered by the catastrophic experience of totalitarian fascist, national socialist, and communist regimes by the Shoah 
and by the abominable destruction of World War II. Political Catholicism left behind its authoritarian corporatist leanings and embraced, finally, Christian democracy and the modern discourse of human rights, now grounding it in the sacred dignity of the human person. Eventually, this slow aggiornamento will culminate in the official aggiornamento of the Second Vatican Council and the pap papal encyclicals of Jan 23rd and Paul VI. All these documents evince a new Catholic transnational global consciousness which discerns the emerging process of globalization as signs of the times. A survey of lay Catholic elites from 103 different countries from all continents taking part in the third World Congress for Lay Apostolate in Rome in 1967 illustrates how widespread the new transnational global consciousness had become so shortly after the Council. 69% of respondents favored the development of the United Nations into a world government, and even a larger proportion, 84%, agreed that individual countries should give up some power so that the United Nations could, be, could do a better job. More significantly, 67% considered immigration quotas immoral, thinking that anyone should be able to emigrate freely to another country. And 90% asserted that Catholic organizations should be active in peace movements. Tellingly, the survey evinces a relative homogeneity and few significant difference of opinion among the, among the geocultural groups from the various continents, north and south, east and west, and those who are on most other issues. Clearly, those participating in the Third World Congress for World Apostolate were a self-selected activist pastoral elite which had internalized the global community spirit of Vatican II. Surveys of ordinary Catholics in various countries throughout the world, including Europe, would have been probably a much weaker transnational global consciousness. As we will see later, a similar gap between global cosmopolitan elites and ordinary people, particularly between pastoral elites and ordinary faithful, is noticeable today within Europe, a gap which to a large extent is at the base of the crisis of the European Union and fits the emergence of the new neo-nationalisms. As the EEC, the European Economic Community, expanded into Protestant Northern Europe and into post-dictatorial Southern Europe, the newly renamed European Union after the Maastricht Treaty in 1993 led on the one hand to greater economic integration among its 50 member countries through the establishment of a common European citizenship and free movement without internal borders, through the establishment of a common foreign and security policy, and most importantly, through the establishment of a common currency, the Eurozone. Social democratic parties replace, replace Christian democracy as the hegemonic force in many European countries, offering a renewed vision to the European project. The drastic secularization of European society certainly had an impact upon European identities and the Christian origins of the European Union were conveniently forgotten. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, European social democracy also entered a slow but serious crisis which became manifest throughout Europe during the 2008 financial crisis. Throughout this process, the European spirit underwent a subtle yet significant transformation from the original Christian communitarian spirit represented by Schumann to a more technocratic, cosmopolitan, and secular spirit represented by Jean Monnet, who now became acclaimed as the father of Europe. This is obviously, I know, a problematic shorthand description of a very complex process. But what has, what has become clear, at least since 2004, is a growing gap between European cosmopolitan elites who support the project of the European Union, but are unable to communicate their European vision clearly and persuasively to large sectors of the electorate in many member countries, 
which feel unrepresented and alienated from the political system. I've chosen this day, 2004, because on the one hand, 2004 represents the date of the enlargement of the AU eastward, incorporating 10 new members, eight post-Soviet Eastern European societies, plus Malta and Cyprus. In this respect, it signifies both the attraction of belonging to the European Union and its great success in incorporating most European countries into its project of a united supranational Europe. But 2004 also represents the unraveling of the ratification of the new European Constitution, which in my view marks the beginning of a series of accumulative crises of the European Union, which still remain open and form the ultimate background for the rise of the new neonationalisms across Europe. The treaty establishing a constitution for Europe was duly signed on 29 October 2004 by representatives of the then 25 member states of the European Union. It was later ratified by 18 member states, which included the referendums endorsing it in Spain, the only large country that had an overwhelming positive uh, uh, affirmation, 75%, yes, and tiny Luxembourg. However, the rejection of the document in the French and Dutch referendums in May and June 2005 brought the ratification process to an end. So now a few words about religious identities, nativist populisms, and neo-nationalism. Before looking into the contemporary context, let me take a few remarks, let me make a few remarks concerning religion, religious identities, and identity politics. Religious identities can be of two general types. Those which differentiate religious groups from non-religious secular ones, and those which differentiate particular religious groups from one another, let's say Catholics and Protestants in Europe. The modern European political system in most countries, in most European societies, was organized around these two cleavages. In Catholic countries, for instance, usually you found a major conservative Catholic party competing with some non-religious, usually anti-clerical, liberal or radical party. In biconfessional countries, as in Holland or Germany, one found, in addition, confessional Catholic parties competing with confessional Protestant ones. After World War II in Western democracies, with the exception of Northern Ireland, the Catholic Protestant cleavers disappear. The Christian Democratic parties that emerged in Germany and Holland after World War II already incorporating Catholic and Protestant groups. Eventually, with the advance of secularization in West European societies, the secular religious cleavage, for all practical purposes, also disappear, and the Christian Democratic parties lessened their religious identity and became non-confessional, catch-all, center-right parties. This was, the, this was the context of my analysis of the deprivatization of religion, which took the form not of the mobilization of religious identities in the public arena, but of religions entering the undifferentiated public sphere of civil society to participate in debates concerning the res publica and the common good. The issue of religious identities has reappeared in Western European societies with the increasing visibility of Muslim immigrants and the difficulties or unwillingness by those societies to integrate those immigrants either as full citizens or as full members of the various national communities. Here, Muslims identity, Muslim identities function not as positive identities self-deployed by Muslim groups for the sake of political mobilization, but it is the form of a negative foreign identity attributed to the minority by the self-defined native majority. But in the process, the majority begins to assume a positive identity defined against the Muslim one. This self-definition of the nativist majority can take any of the two forms we have already mentioned. It can take the form of the traditional religious secular cleavage, or it can take the form of the denom denominational cleavage between two different religious groups, only one of which is defined as native. At the European level, it may take the form of the definition of Europe as secular against the religious Muslims, such as European societies are secular, we are the native secular Europeans, and Muslims are the non-native religious other. Unintendedly, perhaps, 
such identification has the potential of strengthening secularist identities against all religious groups, including Christians. Alternatively, Europe can be defined as culturally rather than religiously Christian. Muslims are obviously non-Christian and therefore non-European. Most frequently, this is an identification deployed by post-Christian secular Europeans rather than by religious Christians. Both dynamics became evident and entangled during the controversies surrounding the drafting of the preamble of the European Constitution in 2004-2005. Indeed, one could argue that the European Union has been in prolonged crisis since 2005, when national referenda in France and the Netherlands failed to ratify the new treaty. Three different, different issues became entangled in the acrimonious debates among the European elites concerning the new treaty. First, the question whether there could possibly be any mention of God or of the European Christian heritage in the preamble of the Constitution, which pointed further to the difficulties in specifying what constituted the supposedly unique European values. Two, the problems experienced by most European societies, the most secular as well as the most religious, in integrating the new immigrants who were predominantly Muslim. And third, the uneasiness about how to respond to Turkey's determination at the time to join the European Union. Taking together all three issues, the secular religious cleavages, the integration of Muslim immigrants, and the imprecise definition of European boundaries pointed to the difficulties in redefining the geopolitical and civilizational identity of a dissented Europe in a globalized world. Post-referendum surveys in France and Holland indicated that resistance against enlargement, particularly against Turkish membership, nativist anxieties over Muslim immigration, and generalized apprehensions over Islam had played some but not a very large role in the punishment board. At most 6% of the respondents mentioned those issues. More crucial in the rejection had been the lack of transparency in the constitutional making process itself and the failure to submit the constitutional text to serious national debates. Nevertheless, politicians throughout Europe prefer to interpret the shocking results as an indication of voter dissatisfaction with the rapid pace of enlargement and of the need clo to close the gates to immigration. Paradoxically, as pointed out repeatedly by Nili Fergele, the identification of Islam as an internal as well as an external threat actually play a functional role, not only in the formation of European-wide identity, but in the very constitution of a transnational European public sphere. Yet the 2007-2008 global financial crisis, and the ensuing 2009-2010 sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone led bare the weakness of any transnational European-wide solidarity. For several years, Islam itself disappeared as a contested issue or was no longer the most prominent issue in European-wide debates. The peaks, Portugal, Ireland first, and Italy later, Greece and Spain emerged as the new threat to European stability. The same Northern European populist parties, which had first emerged as nativist anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim parties, now redirected their xenophobic antagonism against their Southern European neighbors. The old Bavarian Protestant ethic thesis was unearthed to justify the resistance of the thrifty, hardworking, financially responsible, and productive Northern European countries to bail out the profligate, indolent, and irresponsibly indebted Southern European countries. The migrant refugee crisis of 2015-16 reopened the anti-immigrant nativist populism throughout Europe. But the right-wing political parties now turn against the very project of the European Union, blaming their national establishments and the European technocrats for the crisis. A new anti-European populist discourse was becoming widespread throughout Europe, carried by the old anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and anti-globalization parties in France, 
Netherlands, Denmark and Austria, as well as by right-wing populist governments in Hungary and Poland. The threat of Brexit, the electoral success of the anti-immigrant and Nazi alternative for Deutschland entering the German parliament as the third largest party, and the shocking election of the Eurosceptic and pro-Brexit Donald Trump as President of the United States seem to threaten the very survival of the EU. The vision of a single European home from the Atlantic to the Euros was meant to overcome the constant wars between European nation states that had lasted for centuries and had ensued in the two world wars of the 20th century. But such a future-oriented vision was resetting in the face of the reality of a club of wealthy nations seemingly unable to develop solidaristic economic policies that would benefit all its members, to respond in unison to the immigration and refugee crisis, or to confront Russia's new militaries and propaganda challenges. How religion may be implicated in all these developments is not immediately evident. There are traceable connections, but they are mainly indirect. There are perhaps direct connections in the case of Hungary and Poland, where one could point out how traditional forms of national Catholicism, which had served as resistance against the Soviet regimes, have been transformed into anti-liberal nationalist resistance against German hegemony and against the dictates from Brussels or from the European Court of Human Rights. But it's nonetheless surprising to hear right-wing Polish or Hungarian politicians declare that the present dictatorial curtailment of their national sovereignty by Brussels is as intolerable as the one they suffered for decades under Moscow. Moreover, they seem sympathetic not only to Putin's authoritarian regime, but even more so to the discourse emerging from the Moscow Patriarchate trying to mobilize a conservative Christian moral crusade to protect traditional family values against foreign rights standards promoted by the European Union advancing feminist gender ideologies and gay rights. The mutations of the Dutch Party of Freedom led by Gerd Wilders are not less astounding. What was originally a liberal movement defending gay rights, rights against the threat of conservative intolerant Muslim immigrants morphed into a nativist party defending the cultural heritage of Christian Europe against Islamization and ended up as a Eurosceptic Russophile party open to a European-wide alliance of right-wing parties led by Putin. Under the leadership of Marine Le Pen, the French National Front underwent its own surprising transformation. From an anti-Semitic fringe party with roots in Catholic, in Catholic Action Francaise to a national populist, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-German, and anti-European French Nationalist Party. Its nativist French identity is now supposedly grounded in the Republican values of laicite, ironically represented by the bare-breasted Brigitte Bardot and its Muslim Burkinis. It claims to be a French Nationalist Party that at the same time welcomes Brexit, the election of Donald Trump, and the alliance and financial support from Putin's Russia. The religious roots and the religious base of the Alternative are even thinner. It originated, as you will know, in the neo-Nazi movement in irreligious East Germany with an anti-immigrant nativist folkish discourse that gained resonance in all of Germany with the refugee crisis and the discontent with Merkel's open gates policy. It is estimated that the three new million votes received by the AFD in the last elections originated equally from three sources. Dissatisfied Germans who did not vote regularly but were now mobilized by the nativist alarm, circa one million. Dissatisfied voters from the left, SPD and the Linke, also circa one million. Dissatisfied voters from the Christian Democratic Coalition, particularly from the more conservative Bavarian CSU, which openly rebelled against Merkel's pro-refugees policies. In fact, religious groups in Germany, the Protestant Church, Jewish groups, and most prominently, the Catholic Church, have been the most outspoken voices in support of refugees, immigrants, and the most proactive supporters 
of the integration of Muslims and Islam into German society. Christina Steckel will be presenting later in the conference with much greater expertise her analysis of the Russian offensive coordinated by Putin's regime in the Moscow Patriarchate to support a transnational European moral conservative alliance against the liberalism, secular humanism, democratic human rights, and gender rights platform represented by the European Union. Let me simply state that the Moscow Patriarchate had tried already in 2005 five to organize a holy alliance of conservative Catholic and Orthodox Christianity against liberalism, secular humanism, and feminism. At the time in 2005, however, the Putin regime was still developing its own Eurasian geopolitical strategy. By 2012, however, upon entering his second presidency, having been a spook by the threat of the so-called color revolutions in Serbia, Georgia, and Ukraine, Putin changed geopolitical course and decided to strengthen the alliance with the Moscow Patriarchate to begin his restorationist offensive against the European Union and the expansion of NATO while presenting Russia as the defender of conservative, anti-revolutionary, traditional Christian European values. The occupation of Crimea and the war in Donetsk was a clear message of rejection of the Helsinki Agreement not to change European territorial borders by force. It marked also the initiation of a proactive interventionist agenda in European politics aimed to undermine the EU and to return to the old system of power politics balances which had governed European geopolitics and European warfare since the 17th century. Given the unqualified support of the Catholic Church for the European Union and for human rights, the proposal of a conservative holy alliance of the Catholic and Orthodox churches could have only progressed on the basis of a shared platform on gender issues. But even this common platform was weakened. It was obviously a very important platform during the uh, uh, papacies of Boitila and Ratzinger. Even this common platform was weakened after 2013, once Pope Francis, without changing any of the teachings of the church on gender issues, stressed the principles of the hierarchy of truths, placing the gospel values of the Sermon on the Mount at a higher level than the moral confessionalism and gender issues that had defined the public voice of the church in the previous decades. Pope Francis has been the most outspoken European voice in support of immigrants and refugees, and has repeatedly expressed his support for the European Union and his rejection of nationalist populisms of any kind. Indeed, if there is any Catholic support for anti-immigrant nativism and for the conservative alliance with Putin's Russia, it comes from those fundamentalist Catholics, particularly in France, but also in other countries, who are bitter and disappointed with Pope Francis. In fact, given the crisis today, uh, uh, the papacy, uh, the convergence of the two issues, the issue precisely of the gender issue that was the base for the conservative attack on the papacy until now, but now linked to the scandals and sexual abuse, have created really a very explosive situation that is leading to tremendous polarization within the Catholic churches and could develop into a serious a Catholic right-wing coalition, uh, uh, especially if the Pope is forced to resign, and especially if, uh, I mean, this is happening in the United States very clearly. In Europe, uh, Catholicism is much more weakened and doesn't have the, the strength it has in the United States. But nonetheless, this is a very serious possibility that could change the dynamics, really, if a new Catholic right-wing develops across Europe uh, uh, in reaction against the papacy of Pope Francis. Um, I had as a conclusion a very general kind of ideas about our global moment going beyond Europe, but I think that I've spoken long enough. And I thank you, and I open the floor for conversation.